Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, J.P. John Paz. With me today, very special guest. He's, of course, the former king of the death match, former CZW and JAPW World Tag Team Champion. He's the legendary Necro Butcher. Necro, welcome to the two-man power trip. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, my man. Like I said, just... Uh... Staying up on the radio, listening to the chaos that is election night in America. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, it seems to get crazier and crazier each each time uh, that comes around. But what, what's up in your world, though, as far as wrestling wise? What's been going on? Well, this uh, came back into wrestling this this past uh, spring. I had my first match back in a well a couple years, but it'd been a, a few years since I was even healthy. Before that, but I uh, got a got a big match coming up this week out there in in, in Newark, New Jersey, for XPW. You know, it's uh, there. It's a uh, right. I found myself right in the middle of a promotional war, and the, those are always fun to be a member of. But I, I guess XPW is going to run an event in the uh, home venue of uh, ICW there. And then uh, the first match they announced was uh, myself against uh, PCO. So they've announced a few matches since then, but you know my match was the the, the first one they announced. It's kind of hard, you know, as uh, a couple years ago I was down to 160 pounds in a hospital bed. Who would have thought that guy would be in the feature bout of a promotional war against PCO in a couple of years? But uh, life's pretty crazy. That is crazy. So how are you doing physically? Well, I mean, from the knees up, I feel like a million bucks. <laughs> I'm having some issues. Uh, uh, chemotherapy did a number on my uh, lower extremities. Like my uh, my toes are numb permanently. You know, so I'm having a lot of issues with my ankles and my an- ankles and toes mostly. You know, uh, oftentimes I'll think there's uh, rocks in my shoes. I'll be like, how what's in my shoe? There's something in my shoe. It'll be because my my toes are all curled up, <laughs> you know, and I can't feel them. So uh, after 20 years of going around the world wrestling barefooted, I'm now uh, for medical reasons I have to keep those things all bundled up nice in wrestling boots nowadays to avoid breaking things, which I've been doing at a, an alarming rate. Why did you always? I'm just curious. Uh, get back to help in one second. But why did you always go barefoot? Well, there's a a lot of it had to do with you know some of the best decisions in life are made for you. They're not ones that you think about. And at the time, uh, CZW was doing a interpromotional war war with Ring of Honor. And it came to pass where one day uh, CZW was doing an afternoon show in Philadelphia. I was first row. I was there. And there was an evening show in Ring of Honor on the same night. So I was at the Ring of Honor show, and I believe a Canadian wrestler had missed his flight. So I had previously wrestled earlier in the card, and then uh, it came to pass they needed a substitute uh, for for this. Uh, it was a main event, actually. They needed someone to wrestle in the main event. You know, I, I was you know I was done. Uh, my match was over, but the opportunity presented itself to wrestle again and you know, <laughs> grab some more cash. Uh, I was wearing flip flops at the time. And uh, well, I mean, they were a little more fancier than the flip flops. They were uh, yeah, Japanese uh, straw sandals, but I didn't think it'd be very safe to try to compete in those. So just for the sake of that match, I thought, well, I'll give this barefoot thing a whirl instead of you know making everybody wait while I put these boots on. And as it came to pass, then the Ring of Honor show was later that night. And I, believe, I I didn't participate in the show itself. I think I was in somebody's corner or sitting at, standing at ringside for Chris Hero, I think, or something like that. 
and uh, the guys were in the car waiting on me to go across town to the Ring of Honor show. And I'm a big bloody mess, and I'm trying to get cleaned up. And uh, I said, wait, 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 guys, i got to get cleaned up. i got to get cleaned up. And I looked in the mirror, and I just looked horribly unsightly after the <laughs> barefoot barbed wire match. And then I thought, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why am I getting cleaned up? I'm going to go just like this, you know. So I go to the Ring of Honor show, you know, raggedy jeans covered in blood, no shoes on, and just uh, the crowd really got on my case. And some of the just so much, you know, electricity, so much venom from the fans, and they were screaming at me for not having shoes on, and I thought, man, this is great. I'm just never going to wear shoes ever again. So uh, it got me in some predicaments over the years, that's for sure, but uh, you can't really backtrack on something like that once you make a commitment. But here I am 20 years later with mangled, <laughs> mangled up feet, not as a result of those choices, but as a result of the uh, you know poison that is chemotherapy. I mean, let's be honest, chemo, chemo isn't medicine, it's poison. It kills the cancer, but it kills you too. And the longer you're on it, the more of you, the more of you it kills. And neuropathy is a thing that a lot of chemo patients deal with. Generally, like I say, the longer you're on it, the more you're going to experience it and for me it started in my toes and my fingers now my fingers i can move my hands around and i uh, get the sensation back in my fingers but my toes are just dead man <laughs> just the dead dangling little things hanging off my feet it's crazy that's funny like uh, as a fan you're thinking like oh it must be some sort of tribute to the samoans or i don't know something you <laughs> know like you don't <laughs> expect that to be the the story of it well, the, I mean, there's a little bit more to it, but that's that's where it came from. You know, then as time progressed, you know, guys were doing these barefoot death matches, and they were making a thing about it and all this. And I just thought, well, you know what? I'll just I'll go right in there with them, and I'll every match will be a barefoot death match, and we'll just kill this gimmick right now. So there was a a little bit of machismo involved too, you know, just to show how tough you are, which. Makes my current predicament even more ironic, you know. <laughs> through through no, no fault of my own, the the barefoot days are over. Man, so as far as like health is going on, like how'd you get down to 160, and how'd you get back to health where you are today? Well, uh, I had been uh, getting a, at this point. I was out of wrestling, and I was working in a grounds crew for minor league baseball in Dayton, Ohio. And I had just been. I, I didn't have a lot of energy. You know, I, I was really tired all the time. Uh, I was losing a lot of weight. But I just thought, well, this is because I'm all getting older. This is because, you know, uh, eating different, you know, or whatnot. And it just got to the point where I couldn't do my job. And then they put me in uh, ticket sales. I did a grounds crew for a couple of years, and then they moved me to ticket sales because I was too weak to work on the grounds crew. And then after the conclusion of my one season in ticket sales, I was too weak to even do that. So uh, I resigned from my position, resigned from the team, you know. And then it's, it's really crazy because that happened in, uh, I think, February of 20. I resigned from the team. And then maybe two months later, all this COVID stuff started, and the minor league season was canceled anyway. <laughs> you know, so I, I, res I quit a job, and then that job didn't exist for anybody. They can't just suspend the whole damn season, you know, that, that year in uh, – in minor league baseball, but I'd went, I, you know, I went back home and it was a, a chest X-ray is what started everything. I just a normal routine chest X-ray and they just found dozens and dozens of tumors all uh, in my chest cavity, more or less. Oh wow! And that was uh, like some of them were putting pressure on my heart and some were putting pressure on my lungs and you know I, I've, I've uh, you know, of course, I've had too much information now at the time, 
about cancer, but uh, technically speaking, the difference between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, technically, it's uh, the presence or absence of a certain kind of protein in the cancer. If it has this protein, it's the Hodgkin's variety. If it lacks this protein, why then it's the non-Hodgkin's. But from a layman's perspective, you know, typically if they discover the cancer in your chest, it's probably going to be Hodgkin's. And if they discover it somewhere else in your body, it's probably going to be the non First, if they discover it first, you know what I'm saying? If they discover it first outside of your chest, anywhere else in your body, it's typically the non-Hodgkin's. So I had the Hodgkin's, and it it, 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 uh, it took them a while to get me on the right chemo. You know, they, they, they can't just start you on a generic treatment. You know, they have to specifically identify what kind of cancer it is and what kind of chemo they're going to give you. And that took a while. You know, there's a few operations there. I had to get some things cut out of me. Uh, and I think it was three cycles of chemo with no improvement whatsoever. In fact, I got worse. And then they said, uh, all right, after the next one, if there's no improvement, we're just going to take you off the chemo because of what it's doing to you. And as fortune would uh, have it, the fourth cycle is the one that did the trick. And then I stuck around a little while longer, and then we, we did a fifth cycle, you know, just for, uh, you know, for good measure. And that was over two years ago. You know, I've had multiple checkups since then. Everything's good to go. And, uh, it's really crazy. I, you know, I, it, I questioned more why I got better than I questioned why I got sick. But uh, it was pretty bad, you know. So I was wasn't walking anymore, you know, uh, losing my vision. It was it was really crazy. I'd, I'd lay in bed sometimes and I'd think, all right, how much worse is this going to get? How much more am I going to suffer for? This is finally over. And of course, lo and behold, it would get worse. <laughs> you know, something else would, you know, stop working or whatnot. And I, I looked pretty bad. And then, uh, like I said, just as quick as I got sick, I just started getting better ten times faster. One day, started getting better, kept getting better. Still better day, except for the damn feet. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy to see pictures of you. Be like, wow, that can't be necro butcher, you know seen this guy, he's 6'2", 6'3", you know, he's he's huge, and he's big, and then all of a sudden, I was like, oh my god, like, what the what the hell happened to Necro Butcher? It's crazy to see, it was shocking. Yeah, but hey, that was then, this is now, right? Now, now that sick guy you saw is going to be uh, headed off to Jersey to fight a monster in a few days. Yeah, I love that. Very, very cool. Speaking of, like, fighting monsters, so just like you mentioning some of the co-promotion and promotional matches. I went to most of the ROH CDW stuff. I love that feud. I feel like uh, maybe Gabe Sapolsky is best work uh, as a booker, but I don't know. I just love that feud. Just Can you think back about that time period? As obviously, you're a CCW guy, but you're working ROH too. I mean, that's that's uh, pretty good for you. Well, the crazy thing was when the whole thing started, I had no ambition whatsoever of going to Ring of Honor. You know, a lot of the other guys involved in in the matches were strictly trying to get to Ring of Honor. You know, my point of view was at, at that point, CZW was my home, you know. So I don't know what the big picture has for what these guys have going on. But for right now, you know, we've got guys coming into my town, you know, so I'm going to... You know, I'm gonna beat the shit out of them, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, uh, try to make these guys look good because they're the enemy. You know, but uh, it's just it's like saying, you know, life's really crazy, and just ended up that 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 worked out real well, and uh, the fans, you know, really enjoyed my matches. I enjoyed being there. I had some got lucky with some really good opponents, and then. Uh, as 
as the whole thing went on, you know, a lot of things came to pass. And they said, look, we're killing off this uh, CZW angle tonight with this cage match, but we're going to bring you back for by yourself for a, a barbed wire match at Dayton. And then I don't have, we do anything for you, but when something comes up, you're going to be on top of our list. I said, okay, great. You know, I didn't have any ambitions of anything coming out of it, but then, you know, a couple of years went by and this uh, age of the fall thing started and they called me and back I went and I was back there for a few more years. It was a really good time. I really got to, uh, you know, at, at that point, that was, you know, one of the better, well, that was the best company in America I'd, I'd ever worked for. You know, it was uh, really good money and uh, really good opponents. I was at the 100th show. I mean, I was at a ton of these shows and all of them, but I just remember the 100th show uh, before the Cage of Death. It was in April that year. Uh, it was you, Chris Hero, and Super Dragon against Adam Pierce, PJ Whitmer, and Samoa Joe. Half the crowd legit split. And physically split too. I mean, half the crowd was Ring of Honor, half crowd is CZW, but they they would do this later on for KZ. But I mean, a lot of fans would separate. So it was almost like segregated the way they did. It was just crazy how how they yeah. separated the fans like that. But you guys winning, them playing the awesome CZW theme. I mean, it, the crowd was nuts that night when you guys won. <laughs> they were shocked. It's ROH hundred show. No way CZW goes over, and you guys won. <laughs> it was a. Uh, uh, Kind of, hard, you know, it's definitely fun to, you know, sometimes sit, sit and watch these things, or even even just sit and talk about them. Because when you're doing these things, you're not really always appreciating what you're doing because there's something else next week. There's something else in a couple of days. There's, you know, there's always something else going on. You have to, you know, stay focused, stay healthy, or or you have, you know, the car insurance is due, or your kid has this doctor's appointment, or these, you know, appointments and bills and this, that, and the other. But and then when when time goes by, you can look back and say, "Damn, that was that was that was pretty fun." You know, it's uh, best viewed in retrospect, I guess. Then there was uh, the Edison show, which of course I was also at the Ring of Homicide, which would eventually yeah. be called. Adam Pierce, P.J. Whitmer, Smojo again versus Hero Castagnoli this time substitute yeah. for Super Dragon and yourself goes to no contest. We think we're getting Necro Butcher and Samoa Joe, which is an awesome rematch from my yeah. and itself. But instead, we get an awesome match with Homicide and Necro Butcher. Of course, they end up throwing the chairs in the ring and, and all all, cra- all craziness ensues. But that was awesome too. It's like holy shit, Necro Butcher still on the show for uh, for ROH. Who would have thunk it? Well, yes, it's. Uh... Just give me the ball, you know. I, I don't fumble very often. I don't always get big gains, but, you know, I, <laughs> average gains and no fumble. <laughs> when you look at it, it's like, okay. Like, even me personally, like, I don't really care for the deathmatch stuff. Like, yeah, even I interviewed Jack Evans. I was like, I don't really care for the slippity floppity flyer guys. But some guys get a pass. Jack Evans always got a pass for me because I was like, oh, this guy's so awesome. But, like, you for the deathmatch has always got a pass for me. I was like, oh, this guy's he's better than those other deathmatch guys. He's he's different. He's cool. You know, he's, he, and a lot of times, eventually, you'd be barefoot. And like, I don't know, you always had this difference to you. And then you're like, okay, let's see what he does in Ring of Honor. And then they put your Ring of Honor, and you're still in the show. Like, in a show with guys that are always considered show stealers. So it was amazing to see you run in ROH. Like I said, it was a, I mean, it was really a talented locker room. You know, it was, uh, and especially when Gabe was there, because there were no limits on anybody. You know, you know what I'm saying? It was, there was no, you know, if you wanted there, there were there were no restrictions on what you could do. You know, it was the the, the and I I can understand why things changed. I guess, but just to just to be able to be yourself, you know, it, it's uh and like it, it it just makes things so much easier when there's when there's no restrictions on you. And that's what that's what Gabe was to me. Uh, he, you know, he'd explain, uh, you know. Uh, what he wanted going in, and you just it was up to you to figure it out, and that's that was I loved it. And then, of course, Cage of Death. So you're like, okay, ROH, will they finally get the victory? No, Cage of Death is a CZW thing, but will they finally yeah. beat CZW? So the booking of Gabe was smart too, because 
I feel like a lot of guys today they always fall into the trap of no, our guys need to beat their guys, and it kind of ruins it. Like if CCW, if you guys didn't win at our at the hundred show, it's like okay, then then they're not going to win going forward. So you guys win that show, and then kind of keep winning going forward at these different shows. So then Cage of Death comes, and then, then we have a doubt. Plus Danielson doesn't really want to team with Samoa Joe, so that's like a, a you know a question mark, and then like. ROH didn't have a, a, a final guy for the team, so to speak. So then Homicide kind of had to step up and step in. So it was really interesting. Obviously, it was you, uh, Claudio, Eddie Kingston, Nate Webb. Uh, match, I think, it was, man, it was a, I was there. It was a long match, too. It was, had, they gave a good time. But, man, what an amazing sight to see for ROH, who didn't necessarily do those type of matches, especially in that case of death, which is a CGW match. I mean, definitely different. Uh, well, yeah, like, like I said, though, you know, it was uh... – it was all up to us. Let's see. The kid asked for anything more than that. The no ropes barbed wire match was interesting, too, because you mentioned with <laughs> B.J. Whitmer, you guys. What are your thoughts on that? Because that is, a, like you like you said, I mean, I'm going to be as tougher than everybody else, and I'm going to tough it out. But, man, no rope barbed wire, those cannot be, uh, I don't know, good for the skin. No, and, and that building was always really hot. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it would always be, like, over 100 degrees in that building. There was no... Air conditioning. There were the doors were in different rooms. You know, there's no doors to the outside or anything. That place was always so hot. And of course, you know, uh, B.J. Whitmer was from there. You know, so it made a, a great environment with him being, you know, the the local guy against the out of town monster. Man, that was in the dead of summer too. Man, it must have been yeah. uh, scorching in there. Uh, the, the heat's worse than the bar bar. You say? Well, I mean, I don't know. It was the heat's what I remember because I was I, I went there a few times. You know, I just don't remember how hot it was. That's what I always remember about that place. Crazy match too. It was like, wow, you you didn't expect that from Whitmer, but I mean, obviously he stepped up his game. But crazy match to, to, to go through. But uh, obviously you were more used to it than he was. Well, I mean, I've, I've done a few of those. You could, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're uh, they're easy for you. That. Uh, death match, just like that style. Is it just a completely different mindset? I mean, how do you kind of how do you get into it? Well, I mean, I mean, everything is different, but everything's the same. You know, I mean, I did uh, two years of uh, shoe fighting for Antonio Noki's company in Japan. You know, every, everything is. You just have to look at what what you're doing, what you're supposed to be doing, and try to do it the best you can. It's no, like I say, everything's different, but everything's the same. You know, you just have to get a plan and try to stick with it and adjust adjust the plan as you're going as needed. There's, it's not really any different from any other match, you know, in that regard. Do you think death match guys are tougher? Not not necessarily like that every wrestler, but do you think that there's like an extra level of toughness there? Because I mean, you I mean you guys are risking a, a little bit more. I I would say anyway. I re- I don't think it's very different kinds of wrestlers or anything like that. I think you know there's just different uh, philosophies. Um, I mean, I, like I said, but I did all kinds of different things though. You know what I'm saying? I did, you know. I was trained in, in the Sportatorium in Dallas, you know. We didn't do that kind of stuff down there then. And then I just, you know, moved to the East Coast and I'm doing things, you know. And the stuff I did in Mexico was different than the stuff I was doing in Japan. And it just, it just you know, we're a professional wrestler. That's, that's you know, you, you travel and different promotions want different things. And I just always... You know, wherever, you know, I was taking care of my kids. So wherever I could get the money, that's where I was going. And just trying to uh, keep the booking calendar looking good, to keep, keep the bills paid. It's amazing if you look at your career with Anoki, like the names like that pop out. To me, anyway, because I'm a big MMA guy, but like Bob Sapp and Minowa Man. Can't get much more <laughs> different than that, but that's awesome that you wrestled them both. Yeah, it's some, it's some, uh, and Oki had some bad dudes in the roster, man. That's for sure. Yeah, the Predator was over there too, right? Oh, uh, he was a monster. By God. That was, uh, you know, I mean, but then again, that was uh, my first payday for Anoki 
was my first match was uh twenty five hundred dollars. You know, so this big monster was, you know, beating me to death. But in my mind I was thinking, man, I used to go to you know, I did be mid south and guys were swinging baseball bats in my head for forty bucks. Uh, this, is, this is fucking twenty five hundred dollars. Bring it on, you know. And right, yeah. <laughs> I'll show this motherfucker how much I can take, <laughs> you know. Predator in his career. I was talking to his manager, who who did his um, MMA bookings and stuff, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, "How come he didn't do better in Japan?" Turk guy told him afterwards that the Japanese were telling him like not how to fight per se, but like, oh, oh, just um, just make this a stand up fight. But it was an MMA fight, so he'd stand up with like Gary Goodrich or whoever, and he ended up losing. And his manager was like, "Why wouldn't you just take him down and just ground and pound him to death?" So like, he was so big, but you know maybe the mental game wasn't there. He wasn't quite ready uh, for Japan. It didn't seem like, but you know he he could have been bigger, better, and better almost. Well, and yet he just, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of, uh, opportunity too. You know what I'm saying? When you get, uh, you know, and, and, and some, when you have a big guy, it's, uh, a legitimate tough guy, it, it's a little bit harder for them to get into some of the top companies. So with you and, and your career, obviously, and we're talking about a lot of the death matches, we're talking about going to Japan. What are some of just like your favorite matches that you've had? Just a bunch of guys that you could think of, because man, just random matches that you've been in that you, we, we to me would be a surprise. Like, okay, that's not gonna be that great. Like Brian Danielson or Jack Evans, and all of a sudden, like, okay, those were great matches. So, like, who were some of your favorites? Well, there I would be doing so many uh, matches a disservice. I've been really fortunate, really lucky, you know. Uh, and I've also been lucky, I guess, to be underestimated all the time, too. You know, because when you're underestimated, I guess, people don't really have high expectations of you. And it's uh, it's easier to to outperform your expectations when the expectations are very low. <laughs> so I, I, I couldn't really say that, you know. I've had a lot of, a lot of good time. I and mean, this is, I'm going on, uh, you know, well over 20 years into this, so... Yeah, my little break I had recently. I I don't really think I could really do. I think I could really answer that. You know. Can I name a few for you? Oh yeah, sure. That'd be fine. Yeah, draw some memories loose in this brain of mine. Samoa Joe. Yeah, yeah. We had uh, the first one. Boy, I just uh, I I I just uh, that was an afternoon show. And then I had just gotten back from Japan that morning. So I would gotten off the plane. At that point I, in my life, I was driving a 72 Ford pickup. <laughs> and I landed in in Charleston, West Virginia. And then my truck was there at the airport. And got to my truck and drove to Philadelphia and did that match. And then uh, there was a, that was a double header, you know. See, uh, IWA was in the afternoon and CCW was in the evening in the same arena. When uh, wrestled him, and then uh, a couple hours later wrestled the Hay Club. <laughs> so not a not an easy day at the office, especially considering I just got out the plane and driven about six hours in a truck with no air conditioning or <laughs> heater or anything to, to get there. Do you think of it like, oh, man, this is an interesting matchup. I wonder how we'll mesh, or do you think, like, oh, I can mesh with anybody? That, that doesn't matter. I, I, I think when you, you know, when you try to think about things ahead of time, you, you really do yourself a disservice, you know, because, you know, especially some of the, some of the stuff I watched today, I'm, I'm better off not watching it. <laughs> you know, I'll try to watch some of watch some of some of these guys are doing. I'm like, oh my god, this is terrible. I, I got I got I got to turn it off. Well, I'll get there and see what's up. You know, it, it's the same thing. I mean, you just never know. You never know if the other guy's hurt. You you never know about you know what the match before you is going to entail, what the match after you is going to be like, and 
I think you're really doing yourself a disservice by trying to, you know, prognosticate anything in your match. You know, try to – you just got to get there and feel it out. Low key is another one I was thinking of. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely the hardest uh, kick I've ever take, taken was him. That was the hardest kick. Uh, hardest punch would be Masada. Hardest kick would be low key. Definitely he would he would kick me, and sometimes I would not know what the hell was going on, where I was, <laughs> who are these people around me, where are they, where, where, where the, where the, you know, it was. Uh, he would uh, put you in another world sometimes with some of those kicks. Something you were okay with, or you were like, eh, let's not kill me here. Well, I mean, you know, these things, it's it's, 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 it's not ballet. You know, you can, you can tell. There, there's a difference between, you know, somebody knocking the hell out of you and somebody trying to hurt you. You know, I'm, I've been in plenty of situations for both. You know, it's not, uh, I'm not going to get, you know, I'm no stranger to, Contact. I don't ride around around with anybody, but it's never. I never thought. I never thought anything he was ever doing was, you know, unsportsmanlike or anything like that. What about Masada? You mentioned the hardest punch. Yep, that's uh, only two guys have ever dropped me with a punch in my life. I've never been knocked out. But two guys have dropped me. Just for a second now, just for a second. I got back up real quick. <laughs> but uh, only two guys have ever dropped me, and they both have belts in XPW right now. So that's kind of odd. <laughs> both of the both of the guys with belts in XPW are the only guys that ever dropped me. Who was the other guy? A slack got me in uh, this past uh, this past uh, summer. I had to, I had to, I had to take a knee for a second to get back up and start fighting some more. Like, what happened? Why am I on my knee? What did, what just happened? I was I was standing up, uh, throwing punches. Uh, now I'm on the ground. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! <laughs> you know, you used to you know, push that little magic button on, on your jaw. Schlack is giving you a little welcome back. Hey, welcome back to the business, pal. <laughs> yeah, he's. Uh, it was definitely. Uh, a lot more physical than, than my first encounter was with him, but then again, my first encounter was, you know, literally right out of my deathbed into the ring. I was, you know, I've known him for a long time, though, so I tried my best back then, and tried my best this past time, and who knows, maybe I'll try my best a third time one of these days. So I got to rewind it back just a second, because before... Yeah, you know, had me perk up for a second. Sportatorium, where you were trained, were you trained by Black Bart? Yep, that's that's. It. I mean, the ring still said it was the world class ring, and the the ring even said world class championship wrestling on it. And I like the picture of like Devon Eric with the with the claw on the guy. But the show itself was not called world class championship wrestling. I, I I think the show was called CWA. Although, you know, the ring said world class championship wrestling. I think maybe the 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 program might have said the that said C W A or something like that, but it was it was the company it was the, the it was the last company to run uh in the sportatorium. it was uh, C W A I think it was called. What were you doing down there or were you living down there? I was in the army, and I was at that point. I was stationed. In, I was stationed in Fort Hood, and I had, uh, you know, this was the army wasn't tremendous money. Well, it's not now either, but it was even less money back then. But you know, for a poor kid from West Virginia, it was a tremendous amount of money. And what does any poor kid from West Virginia do when he gets money, he buys fancy toys. So, you know, this was back before this was back when satellite television wasn't direct TV or disc network or any of the, like the little uh, plastic dish on the side of your house. Back then, satellite TV was this big, gigantic monstrosity in your yard that was 
anchored in concrete, and it moved. When you change channels, you know, this big dish would rotate, you know, to get to catch the various uh, satellite signals. And I was, uh, I, I was, uh, I guess they, they, they later determined this to be called tape trading. You know, I was, I was, rec- you know, I was watching stuff from Memphis and, you know, stuff from Smoky Mountain, and there was uh, like the Savoldi's promotion in New Jersey, and then there was, you know, ECW when it was uh, NWA Eastern Championship Wrestling or something like that. I think it was called. And there was, got uh, there was maybe nine hours of Lucha Libre on a week. You know, and I was I was recording all these wrestling shows and getting on the internet and trading tapes, and I was you know getting all the you know the New Japan TV, all Japan TV stuff from uh, stuff from all kind of, all over the world, and just trading them. And then I began uh, selling some tapes of uh, Japanese TV to. Uh, guys that were training in the sportorium. You know, they were just trying to get, you know, uh, Japanese moves and stuff like that. And then just in the course of corresponding with these gentlemen, you know, they invited me to come up to the sportorium for a tryout. You know, and I never, and the Army was paying the bills. I never had any ambitions of wrestling or anything like that. But I thought, well, this is pretty cool. You know, I'm I'm in okay shape. Or so I thought, I'll go up here and uh, go to the sportatorium and uh, I'll be in a wrestling ring and I'll be real wrestlers and this will be kind of cool to say I did it, you know. And uh, Wrestling schools were a lot different back then. Uh, back then, you you know, nowadays you just pay so much a week or so much a month and it just goes on for whatever certain amount of time. And then whenever the agreed upon time limit has elapsed, you then proclaim yourself a professional wrestler, you know, is it's kind of string you along to get all this money, but uh, when I got in, you had to pay a bunch of money all up front, and they beat this shit out of you <laughs> to try to get you to leave because they already had your money. <laughs> you're not, right, not, right. not, not your problem, you're, you're sticking around, so they wanted to beat your ass as bad as they could to, you know, you know, and it was, I mean, it was a pretty hefty sum. It was, you know, four digits, you know, and then some I had to pay just for this damn tryout. But I knew that, and I said, well, you know, the Army's, the Army's okay. This will be kind of fun to go do. And then at the end of this uh, tryout or whatnot, they, they asked me if I was coming back next week. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to tell these guys I'm not coming back. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll see you next week. I'll be back again next week, guys. And I said to myself, I'm just going to keep coming back until they tell me not to come back. And, you know, a few a few weeks went on, and uh, I was being able to handle myself a little bit better. Then uh, a few more weeks went along, and the next thing you know, I'm I'm the one beating people up. <laughs> you know, it was uh, it was just a, a lot different. You know, I mean, I think it was maybe six weeks before you can even get in the ring. They just have you on the floor, you know, doing like leg locks and hammer locks and wrist locks and bear hugs and, you know, learning all these moves, all the holds and the counters and the reversals and the blocks and all that. It was a lot different. So I I did, I was fortunate enough to get a very uh, good Chorus of the basics when I started. Man, it's amazing to think. Necro Butcher, Sportatorium, Black Box. Yeah. It's yeah. Funny. Uh-huh. yeah. It's funny yeah. how that all works out. Tape training and training, and then yeah. obviously different worlds back then. They kick the shit out of you. But yeah, yeah. that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What a wild time. I mean, to, to think of you, obviously, as more of a Northeast guy, even to think about you in the like, Texas scene is just interesting to think about. Yeah, and my. my... First, I've been, I think I've been wrestling about ten months before I ever got any money, and I got fifty dollars in, in the form of a check. But I got fifty dollars to wrestle uh, Chris Youngblood, 
So I, my first match, my first few matches weren't anything of note, but my my first payday in wrestling was uh, it was for uh, Chaz Taylor's dad, T- oh, Tug okay. Taylor. Tugboat, yeah. Yeah, nice. I, I got fifty bucks to wrestle Chris Youngblood, and uh, because some character named the Mongolian Mauler, he had like a ponytail and black contact lenses. Well, the Mongolian Mauler did not show up. And I, I was uh, carrying Bart's bags to this show. And there was another guy. There was two of us carrying bags. The other guy was bigger. He was like 340, 350, big guy. And uh, I think it was either Chaz or Tug or somebody said to Bart, that, that big kid, uh, can he work? And Bart said, yeah. And he said, uh, well, go get your shit. And the big guy didn't have his shit. He said, hey, Dylan, you got your shit. I said, sir, my shit's in the car. <laughs> so uh, always have your shit in the car. <laughs> so that, was, that was my, my person that finally got some money because <laughs> I had my shit in the car. <laughs> well, that is great. I, I love it. Um, just as we wind it down, we'll head towards the finish here. What do you think is the legacy of uh, Necro Butcher? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, it, it especially got even crazier, you know, the past couple of years. You know, just when I, <laughs> you know, I, I thought this whole thing was over, it came back around and got just as hot for me as it ever was. I mean, I'm I'm telling more promoters no than I'm saying yes to. You know, it's just uh, now this XPW stuff's going on. I went back and did some more things with ICP. Uh, CZW Tournament of Death was last weekend. Now CZW is going to start doing stuff again. And, uh, I have no clue what I guess what the legacy would be, but just, I mean, uh, the most important, thing I can think of would be, you know, just uh, just keep fighting, you know, uh, on any journey, whether it's a, a physical journey, if you're going somewhere, or a, a financial journey of trying to save money or an emotional journey with some sort of, you know, relationship or whatnot, the one thing you're not in charge of, you're, you're rarely in charge of where you begin on this journey. But the one thing you're definitely always in charge of is when you quit. Just never quit. So always stay fighting. And, you know, like I said, everybody saw me in that wheelchair those years ago. Uh, who'd have thunk it? <laughs> who'd have thunk what's going on now? Just got to keep fighting. If I can inspire people to keep fighting, I guess that's pretty cool. Absolutely. Is there a place where people can follow you on social media? Do you do a lot of that? Uh, I The only thing I really play with is the Facebook, and I wouldn't have even have got on that, but there was a, a fake me on Facebook. <laughs> so I, like, People would say, like, I, I saw you did this, and I saw you did that. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? What what the hell's a Facebook? <laughs> you know. So I, I, I made a Facebook just to stop this. Uh, imposter me and really the only thing I really do on Facebook is uh, I, I post uh, Skeletor memes and uh, do things to upset liberals and just uh, <laughs> it's mostly very childish things I do on Facebook but I mean, you, you can find me on there you can send me a friend request I guess and you can be subjected to my numerous inappropriate memes all right, awesome. Necro, thank you so much for all the time. I really appreciate it. Great to finally get you on. Okie dokie. Thanks for taking it easy on me, man. Everything was a blast. And, and I tell you what, it was really nice to reminisce about that Ring of Honor stuff because I haven't really talked to anybody about that in a long time. And that sure was a lot of fun. And thanks for bringing that stuff up. All right, awesome. No problem at all. Thank you so much, Necro. Appreciate it all the time. Okie dokie. Don't forget that baseball card now, brother. <laughs> Mike Maddox is on yes. the way to you. That, that, that's the, uh, I'm a Cardinals fan. That's a uh, minor league card of the current uh, Cardinals pitching coach. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Coming your way, but thank you so much. Nick. I right. appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, buddy. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. 
Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.